everyone, all my joyful creators. Welcome to Cup to Hook Bible Chats. My name is Cynthia with Cynthia's Joyful Creations. And we spent a good bit of half of a year looking at the book of Proverbs and we finished that up last Friday. And so today and for the next five weeks, including today, we are going to look at the book of Esther. Now, with the book of Proverbs, we looked at one chapter a week, but the chapters in Esther are very, very short chapters, so we will do two chapters a week. All right. Before we get started, I always like to open up in prayer and just ask God to be with us and to open our hearts and to clear our minds so that as we study his word that we are focused on what he's trying to deliver to us and we try to block out all the outside distractions. So let's just bow in prayer real quick. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful Friday that you have given us. Father, thank you for getting us through yet another week and help us as we go into the weekend to rest and laugh and enjoy our family and our friends, Father. Thank you that things are getting a little bit back on the normal track where we are able to socialize with our friends and family a little bit more. Maybe even return to our church services. Father, fellowship is such an important thing. And I thank you that we are able to come together through this platform and study your word and grow as men and women who desire to have a relationship with you. Lord, just help us to open our hearts and our minds to your word that we would not only hear and see and study but father that we would apply it to our life that we would let it have a cause and effect father help us to clear out all the distractions I know we have such busy crazy schedules but Lord help us in just this moment to focus on your word and to just spend some time with you the devil's gonna try many many things to grab our attention and father we just ask that you just put a little shield of a bubble around us as we just take this moment to study Esther chapter 1 and 2 we love you and your son so much and we thank you for giving him to us Lord that all of our sins can be forgiven we love you and we ask all this in your name and your son's name amen so I know I tried, you know, doing the little thing where we just kind of pray and have a quiet time at the beginning and the end of the Bible study, partly because I know I'm not a great singer, but it just, it just seems to help me when I just kind of praise him a little bit. So we're going to go back and do a couple little praise songs today. Again, don't focus on my voice, focus on the words and just let them you know, melt into your heart and become a part of who you are. So let me grab a little bit of a drink again. And moisten my throat. And let's do our uh, Love Them in the Morning song. You ready? And we'll just go ahead and sing it through twice. Love them in the morning when you see the sun arising. Love them in the evening cause he took you through the day. And in the in-between times when you feel the pressure coming. Remember that he loves you and he promises to stay. Love them in the morning when you see the sun arising. Love them in the evening cause he took you through the day. And in the in-between times when you feel the pressure come. 
come in. Remember that he loves you and he promises to stay. I hope my voice holds out. <clears throat> For some reason, my voice is trying to go away. And let's do the sanctuary song. I just love that song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you and let's do the Hallmark song well you know I love you Jesus but so often I don't say how you filled my life with love and joy each and every day. So I'm singing you this love song and I hope that you will see what I'm really giving you is all of me. Well, you know I love you, Jesus, but so often I don't say how you filled my heart, my life with love and joy each and every day. So I'm singing you this love song and I hope that you will see what I'm really giving you is all of me. So Esther chapter 1 and chapter 2. First off, the, let's do a little introduction on Esther. Esther is the last of the historical books of the Bible. And the main character in the book of Esther is none other than Esther. <laughs> and Esther was born a Jewish girl, but we're not going to get into that at the moment. At the moment, we're going to talk about her Persian name, which is Esther. And Esther means Venus, the morning star. And it basically says that the light shed, it sheds its light after all the other stars have ceased to shine and while the sun still delays rising. And so we'll understand even more as we learn Esther's role in this short, you know, 10 chapter book. And basically it, it's, it's a reference to the deeds of Queen Esther and that those deeds will cast a ray of light um, toward or forward into Israel's history from a dark time. So let's pray my voice holds out. I apologize. I don't know why. It's so raspy. I haven't really been doing any talking. All right. So chapter one is titled a queen is deposed. Deposed means removed from a position. Usually it's a position held in some kind of office or in some kind of high regard. And so let's go ahead and take a look at the first two verses in chapter one. This is what happened during the time of 
And I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce any names. I am not good at names that are not your common names. I'm just going to apologize right here. And then going forward, I'm just going to say it as I perceive it and do my best to pronounce it correctly. All right. This is what happened during the time of Exorcist. The Exorcist who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Exorcist resigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa and in the third year, okay, from the citadel of Susa. All right. First off, King Exorcist, and that's what he's commonly known as, was actually King Ahasuerus. It's not even any better. Um, but he was commonly known as King er Exorcist. He inherited the vast Persian Empire from his father, Darius I. And at this time that this is being written um, is about 483 B.C. Exorcist was planning for a doomed invasion of Greece. And at this time, the city of Athens was in its classical glory. And in Greece, they were actually celebrating the 79th um, Olympic Games. So moving on to verse 3 through 9. And in the third year of his reign as king, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials the military leaders of Persia and Medea, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant, in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each other what he wished. Queen Vash Vashiti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Exorcist. All right. So this first feast was for all the government officials, okay? And basically, the only reason that King Exorcist even had this feast for 180 days, can you imagine partying for 180 days straight? Whew. Anyway, the only reason he did this was to show off all the glory and splendor of his riches and the riches of his kingdom. So it says that this feast lasted 180 days. I mean, let's face it, after a week, you know, you, you might be able to hold up a pretense for a week. But after that, you know, truth comes to light because it's hard to mask things. Can you imagine how he had to really keep things in check for 180 days. And the food, I mean, think about the food that was involved. And if he was letting everyone drink at their leisure and as they wanted, I mean, the alcohol that had to be supplied, I mean, this was an expensive feast. So we can already tell that King Exorcist is a very prideful man. He prides on appearance. The second feast was for the citizens of the capital city, Shoshan, and it lasted seven days. So it only lasted a week. 
The basic reasons for this feast was pride. The king wanted to impress his subjects with a great display of his own wealth, excuse me, power, majesty, and generosity. There is no doubt that he paid for this feast out of the public treasury. There's no way this came out of his pocket. Each guest was obliged to have a drink with the current round or else leave the party. But at the second feast, the king commanded that each man could drink as he pleased. The third feast was for the women in the royal palace and it was conducted by the king's wife, King Vashiti. Vash Vashti? Vashti. I'm trying, you guys. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to pick up and we're going to read verses 10 through 11. On the seventh day, when King Exorcist was in high spirits from wine, he was drunk. <laughs> he command in that a, a, a very uh, elegant, eloquent way to say someone's drunk, was in high spirits from wine. <laughs> he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass to bring him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. All right, so what we don't know, what they haven't really gone into, um, is first of all they did underline that he was drunk okay he was in high spirits <laughs> he was very very happy <laughs> um, but there was an argument going on at the party at the feast and it was among the men and they were discussing about which country had the most beautiful women all right so we've already learned in these quick few verses I mean even in the first two verses we learn that, that King Exorcist is a very prideful man. So he thinks very high. He has a very high regard of himself and of his palace and the things that he owns, his property, and he wants to be showy with them, you know. And it's funny because a lot of times when someone's trying to show off something, it's either A, they're covering something up, or it's not really... What they're, show, what they're trying, the appearance they're trying to portray is really not the truth. And so as we know, I mean, he wasn't paying for this party out of his hands. It was coming out of the public treasury. So we already know he's a shady character. We already know that he's full of pride. So when these men are discussing which of their countries has the prettiest women... Well, right away, the king claims that Persia does, but he goes even further. Countries? Have you seen my wife? I mean, she is something to look at. So he basically ends up calling for her. And he's going to settle the issue on which country has the prettiest women, starting with his wife. Um, and put her on public display. However, there was an implication that she was expected to, to display herself in an immodest way. So now let's look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Okay, Queen Vash Va Vashti is not a overzealous, godly woman, but she did have morals and values, and she knew right from wrong, and she knew that it would be wrong for her to go out and expose her body in front of these people. Now, 
there's a hint, she didn't do it, but there's a hint that she didn't do it because of just her, her morals and values. Some say that she was actually struck with leprosy. Now, I didn't dig far enough to find out if that was true or not, but the point is, is she didn't go, and the king was furious. Well, why was he so furious? I mean, why as a husband would you ask your wife to appear before friends, colleagues, and associates, people you don't even really know that well, nude? I mean, that is disrespectful. And, I mean, thank God my husband would never <laughs> ask me to do that. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing it's disrespectful. I mean, our body is not only a temple to God, but when we commit to one another, that our bodies are to be only on display for, you know, our, our significant other, our spouse. And to ask her to do this, I mean, wow. And then he's angry. He's angry because she won't come. And if you remember, She's not even at this feast. She's hosting her own party in a whole different part of the palace. So he's furious that she won't come. She won't put her beauty on display, both, excuse me, her face and her, her naked beauty. And so he's mad because he's taught this big game and now he has nothing to back it up with. And he's drunk on top of it. So he's furious. All right, let's read on to verse 13 through 22. And this is going to finish out this chapter for us. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who, the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king, Karshina, Sethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Mirs, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven nobles of Persia and Medea, who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? He asked. She has not obeyed the king, the command of King Exorcis Ex, that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mamukin replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen, queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but against all the nobles and the people of all the provinces of King Exorcis. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, Well, King Exorcis commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Medea, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Exorcist. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased and this advice with this advice. So the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler of his own household using his native tongue. Wow. So because his wife would not come before this mass group of people, in her nudity, he is not only stripping her of her title, but she will be forbidden to ever be in her, his presence again. 
Wow. Pride do come before the fall. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys. So here we are. The sad part about it is, is first off, the king should have honored the dignity of his wife. But because he's so proud and he was so angry and so drunk, instead, he just proved just how much of an unreasonable and foolish man he is. The purpose for the harsh treatment of Vashti was so that she would not set a bad example to the other women of Persia. The king wanted to reinforce the idea of a man's leadership in his home. So here we are now. Queen Vashti was ordered by her husband to come nude to his party and she refused. And rather than honoring her dignity and respecting her, he listened to the advice of his, you know, best friends, so to speak. And she can no longer be in the presence of her husband. She is no longer queen and they're going to put somebody in her place. This is what happens when people abuse authority. But that's not what we're focusing on. So now we're going to go into chapter 2. And chapter 2 is called Esther is Chosen Queen. Now something that you're going to have to know is that between chapter 1 and chapter 2, actually four years take place. So from the time that Queen Vashti is exiled to a part of the palace that the king doesn't really go into, and until he announces Esther as queen, four years go by. So now we're going to look at what happens in those four years. So we're going to start out with verses 1 through 4. Later, when King Exorcist fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa and let them be placed under the care of Hegei, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young women, then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Okay. <laughs> so, as we discussed, four years have passed, okay, and he has remembered what his queen did to him and he needs to have a queen not only that he wants to have a wife and I probably shouldn't say this but I'm surprised that four years have gone by but we're gonna learn just how deep King Exorcist hatred for the Jews is and what he's planning and what he's been strategizing to do that has kept him kind of preoccupied because that's how deep and how great his hate is. And now that he kind of feels like he's, you know, got a plan in action, it's now time for him to find a new wife. So here we are. And so the king has made his great unsuccessful invasion of Greece during this time. So remember back in chapter 1, we learned that he was going to um, have this invasion of Greece. And we talked about how Greece was having the 79th you know, Olympic Games at that time. Well, here we are four years later. And if you know anything about the Olympic Games, and then every four years, uh, 
Is it every four years or every two years? I can't remember. So maybe the Olympic Games are going on again or getting ready to go on. But anyway, he tried to invade Greece. He tried to destroy it. And he was not successful. So he's come home. He's a defeated man. And so what we know about King Exercis is he's prideful. You know, he wants things to go his own way. This plan that he had after four years of planning and strategizing, knowing that he was going to take Greece and, and claim it, you know, but he didn't. So now he's at home. He's sulking. He's got his tail between his legs. He's unhappy. And so in order to cheer his heart um, through sensual diversions, he has decided they've come up with this plan um, to assemble a harem from the most beautiful women of the land to choose the most favored woman to be queen. So this was kind of, in a way, if you will, like a Miss... Persia Empire contest. You know, it was like a beauty pageant, basically. And the winner would be queen instead of Vashti. So, uh, they gathered all these beautiful women from, you know, all over. Uh, and they end up gathering about 400 women. Now, that's some dating game there. All right, let's look at verses 5 through 7. Now, there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, and his name was Mordecai. He was the son of Jer, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiasin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadasha, whom he brought up because she had neither father nor mother. And this young woman, who is also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. All right, so we have Mordecai. All right, and Mordecai has his own, you know, uh, higher up position in the city so so he's well known well respected and his cousin's parents were killed when his cousin was a young girl so he brings her in and he raises her as his daughter instead of a cousin and so he's he's a father figure to her she's a very beautiful and attractive young girl and she's of Jewish descent well, what we know is King Exorcist hates the Jews. Esther, her Jewish name is Hadassah, H-A-D-A-S-S-A-H, -S 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 okay? Her Persian name is Esther, so when they were exiled, Mordecai changed her name to Esther. All right. Um, so, uh, Hadasha, in the Jewish terminology, means myrtle. And her Persian name, Esther, means star, which we talked about at the very beginning, okay? All right. Let's look at verse 8. Yep, let's look at verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. All right. Esther didn't have a choice to go to the, the palace. Okay. She was beautiful, so she was chosen. So she's kind of there against her, her, 
her own will, so to speak. All right. Um, Haggai was the king's eunuch, and he was entrusted with the oversight of all these women that were coming in. Verse 9, she pleased him, talking about Haggai, and won his favor. So immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. So in other words, Haggai not only found her to be the most attractive, but he loved her spirit, he loved her eloquence, he loved everything about her. So now all these women are going under a form of beauty treatments, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit more. They were given one attendant to them. <coughs> Do you remember how many Esther was given? Seven. Seven people. And then they were moved to one of the more better rooms that was where the harem, you know, where, where they were housing them. So she's getting top-notch treatment. So Esther obtained favor with Haggai and preparation, and, and he gave her special beauty preparations beyond her allowance. All right, going into verses 10 and 11. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. All right, so together, Mordecai and Esther, but more under Mordecai's instruction, um, decided to wait for an opportune moment to reveal her Jewish identity. She's not covering it up. Um, she's just waiting for the right moment to reveal it. Now, I mean, it's never good to hold back and, and, and keep something, you know, from people. Uh, meaning like you're, you're really close to. And it's, it's not good to cover up and hide your Christianity. But Mordecai knew that being in the palace of a king who hated and despised Jews, Esther was in a dangerous place. And as this father figure to her, he's concerned. He's afraid for her. And we see this and we see the love he has for her when he, you know, walks back and forth, paces um, every day to uh, make sure her well-being is, is taken care of and she's okay. All right. Verses 12 through 14. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Exorcist, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shaaskas the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. All right. The reason that they had beauty treatments for 12 months for a whole year was to make sure to start off with that when they came into the palace that they weren't already pregnant because the king certainly didn't want to be held responsible fathering a child that wasn't his. So that's why the beauty treatments lasted for 12 months. All right. Now, Haggai is entrusted to all of the women. But once they've come to the palace and the king has decided, mm, that's not, that's not the one. Then they're entrusted to the care of Shashkas because, and they're considered a concubine. And the reason being is because the king doesn't want them. 
and because they have been brought in to him, he's now they're now considered his property. And so therefore they are not free to leave. They are not free to be with any other man. Now, it doesn't say that he won't marry them because he, he might because he had wives and he had concubines. And, and so that is awful. 399 women are going to be rejected and this will be their life. They will be cast to another part of the palace where they will basically live as a widow, so to speak. Because they won't be allowed in the presence of the king. Because you're not allowed in, in the presence of the king unless he calls for you. I mean, you can be executed, you know, if you go to the king and he hasn't called for you. So these women are basically shunned and... only left with these other women they can't go back to their homes they can't find loves of their lives or the love of their life so and they're brought here basically against their will that is just sad 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 all right let's look at my notes Persia was one of the many uh, countries famous for the aromatic perfumes and ancient customs for the preparation of brides. One reason for the lengthy time of preparation was to tell if the women were pregnant upon coming into the harem so the king would not be charged with fathering a child that was not his. The 399 women not chosen were banished to the harem as the king's wife or concubine and rarely ever saw him. They were never free to marry another man Excuse me, and essentially living as a perpetual widow. That's just awful. Alright, verses 15 through 18. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihel, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Exercis in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials, and he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberty. So Esther's beauty and godliness won favor with others. She was also chosen as queen. God has a plan and Esther's a part of it. Okay? So there's a plan for all this. Now remember, King Exercis despises the Jews. And his lovely, beautiful new bride is secretly a Jew. And he doesn't know this yet. So we can only imagine how this story is going to unfold. All right, let's look at verses 19 and 20. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, but Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality. Just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time, oh, okay, that's it. All right, so Mordecai was associated with the decision makers and the men of influence in the kingdom. So that's what we learned there, and we've kind of already mentioned that. All right, going into the last verses of this chapter, verses 21 through 23. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bixana, 
and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Exorcus. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles, and all this was recorded in the book of the annuals in the presence of the king. All right, so these, these two men that worked for the king had decided to come up against him and plot to kill him. Mordecai overheard their conversation, and he told his daughter. And she, in turn, told her husband. Her husband did an investigation and found out it was true. And so he had these men killed on what's called gallows. And gallows are these poles that are put into the ground at a, at a kind of a, a slant. And they're impaled on them. And it's, it's, it's actually kind of graphic. And I think we go into more detail in that in the next two chapters. But basically... You're held over this tree that has been witted down to a sharp point on one end and then it's stuck in the ground and you're lowered and your legs are spread apart and basically that sharp pole is impaled through your fundamentals all the way up your body and comes out your neck. And the worse the crime you've committed, the more of a statement they want to make, the higher that gallow stands so that everyone can see you. And so these two men were killed on a gallow. So they weren't like hung from a tree. They were literally impaled on these trees, these sharp, you know, pointed trees. And what a very, oh, uh, painful death so all right so that brings us to a close and if you're like me I was like oh no I want to keep going this is a great story so we'll have to just come back and we'll have to see you know does Queen Esther tell her husband that she's a Jew um, what happens to Mordecai you know Will he get blamed for being part of this assassination? Will he be rewarded for bringing the news and saving the king's life? So those are all things that we will have to wait and see. But I hope you've enjoyed this. I um, am very excited about this little short story. Uh, again, we were introduced to Queen Esther while we were studying Proverbs. And so, yeah, we'll have to come back next week and see what chapter 3 and chapter 4 hold. But a uh, very interesting story. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it. All right. Well, I am going to take a few minutes to pop up all of our prayer requests up here and hope that you will take a look at those and you will help pray for these folks. If you have any prayer requests that you want me to pray for um, and you want to be on a more personal level just between you and I, you can certainly email those to me. Um, but if you don't mind and want everyone to kind of put you on your prayer list then you can just leave them in the comment section here and we will have that and then I will get you added to our prayer list to appear on screen next week so I'm going to put those up and then we'll go right into some instrumental music and then I will lead us in prayer and we will close for today so thank you for joining me for this Bible study. I thoroughly enjoyed it and hope you did as well. And here is your prayer request.
Father God, thank you so much for being right here with us today. As we study your word, Lord, and as we opened the book of Esther and found a great story, I know it's one that I'm excited to come back to and find out what's going to happen next. And Father, as we go through the book of Esther, may we learn the importance of being true to ourselves, being proud of who we are, not only where we've come from, but as sons and daughters of a king. Lord, we just ask that you go with us this week, Lord, that we will trust you to provide and to protect us, that, Lord, that we would live umbrella under your will. Father, that we would trust you because, after all, you're a God, a Father that loves that has mercy, that has forgiveness. You are a mighty God that saves. Father, we have so many loved ones that are presented here on these prayer requests and some that are not mentioned who just need to feel your presence, Lord. They need you to touch them and heal their bodies. Father, we pray for those that are still struggling to overcome everything that's happened through the pandemic. We pray for those that are on the front line still trying to heal sick people and take care of them. Father, you know the needs of your children's heart. Some are spoken, some are not. Lord, we all deal with something and we all carry something. Instruct us and teach us to give it to you and trust you. To handle it according to what you desire for us. Because, Father, you see what's going to happen down the road. We don't. Lord, so many of us are struggling with so many different things. Health, finances, relationships, jobs. Father, we just give all of this to you. We know that you care for every detail of our life, big or small. You want to be a part of it. May we have the faith to believe that you will take care of us and take us to the next chapter of our life that's better for us than we can even imagine. Lord, we love you so much, and we ask all of this in your name, in your son's name, and just ask that you be with us until we come together again. Amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. May the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in his hands. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.